Joe Mullings from 160 Studios, back together with Steve Bell. Steve, good to see you, my man. Hey, great to see you. I uh, I got a lot of fantastic feedback from our last session on our uh, overview of soft tissue robotics. So I think you and I have agreed that we we should think out loud together at all the emerging categories of robotics coming out. So what do you think? Yeah, I'm game for that. That's that's good. Yeah, and I got great feedback too. And they they love the format, by the way. They love the format of your your podcast. So they're really, really um, complimentary about the format. So great. Well done. Yeah, well, the partnership here makes it super easy. You know, both being educated, we were chatting before we went online, is the amount of inbound questions and sort of comments that we get uh, around where's robotics going next uh, is certainly exciting. And it's where the investment dollars are going, technology's going. And I think the outcomes for the patients as well, Steve. But I think today we wanted to talk about um, endovascular robotics and, and seems to be an underappreciated category. So I know you've done a little thinking on that. So where do you want to start? Yeah. So, I mean, it's been an area that um, there's sort of been a lot of dabbling in it early on. Um, and some companies have been out there with endovascular robots. And I, I was involved a lot with endovascular work in a previous startup uh, out of California. And it always felt to me like there was a there was a need to be in there. And it's actually been, especially over, over the last couple of weeks when people have been asking me, what, where are the companies going? What are they going to do? Where do they go next? If they want to get multiple platforms, where do they go? You know, soft tissue laparoscopic, bronchial, uh, renal robots. And then kind of you look at it all and you start thinking to yourself, there's like a multi-billion dollar opportunity sitting in endovascular. So it's, it feels a bit natural. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it sets up well for robotics because I think in the U.S. alone, there are 5 million procedures when you look at neuro, uh, peripheral, uh, uh, and, and, and cardiac. So, you know, the procedure's there. The, the intention of a robot um, is to continue to do the same motion over and over and over, even in the master-slave environment, right? So, yeah. so when you think about these interventionalists having to use their fingers in a wire um, and all feel and all touch to get to through a torturous sort of uh, anatomy. I just, you know, you scratch your head going, how come we haven't gotten traction there yet? Corinda's tried early on in, um, but you know, first movers a lot of times always have a challenge there. Yeah. Yeah. And it is, it's difficult as well. And also, you know, um, I think there's a lot of learnings that you get as you go into this. You know, what, what do people really want? Whenever you're a first movie, you've got to make some assumptions of what you think you're bringing to the table. And maybe with Corindus on the, on the cardiac side, they didn't bring quite as much for the patient as they thought they were going to bring. And they thought they were bringing a lot for the physician. And maybe that wasn't compelling enough for the whole picture to, to, to make it work. But I think, um, there's a lot of learnings that have come from that, and that's why I think it's going to be an interesting time because a lot of technology change is going to change as well. Yeah, and the lessons learned. You bring up a really interesting point. There's a there's a incubator out there that I have a lot of respect for, and <clears throat> the founder said to me, you know what I do, Joe? When I pick a technology to go after, I don't go after something that I have to create a market. I, I just don't want to have to get enough wind in my sails to do that. What I want to go after is a mass market, that already has a player or two in it. And I can look at that and say, I could make that tremendously better. I can have better outcomes, better price point, easier for the team and the user uh, and outcomes for the patient. And then I want somebody else to look at what I put to the market and say, you know what, that's too good. Let's go find something else to compete against. And, and yeah. I think the end of vascular robotics space sets up for that because Right now, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Steve, but right now you really only have, I'd say two, maybe three acquirers of soft tissue robotic platforms. You've got the two obvious, J&J yeah. &J and Medtronic, and then you've got potentially Striker, I've heard, been sniffing around in there. Yeah, yeah, but beyond, beyond that, you know, it's not really one of the big strategics that would either have the horsepower or the infrastructure to take it on and actually do something good with it. So yeah, it's very limited, very limited, but, but it is different in endovascular. 
Yes, and the vascular. You know, I think you and I went through it. You've got BSC, certainly Medtronic, Edwards, Abbott, Stryker, Becton, Dickinson, Siemens, GE, like one after another after yep. another. And there's an argument to be said that you can use that robotic platform for, again, neuro, peripheral, and um, cardiovascular. Yes, yes. And again, I think... Um where for me the excitement here as well is you're starting to get a confluence of technologies that are coming together that can improve on what we've got you know again i think one of the one of the issues that you ha have in early days when you do any kind of robotics is you're trying you're trying to just mimic what the physician does okay so rotate a wire push a wire push a catheter pull a catheter okay and they they are maneuvers that they do today because you can't reach inside and manipulate the tip with your fingers. So the natural fallback is I, I create a system that is really just trying to mimic what the physician is doing today. Whereas where I think we've we, we've got now, and, and and again I look at companies like Intuitive, and I look at uh, Auris, and I look at the technologies in there for catheter manipulation, tip manipulation, navigation. Um, you can use a lot more computing power now to lay down pathways. Uh, through the through the vasculature, so my brain is sort of looking at this and saying, I think there's going to be some of these technologies as they come into these catheter technologies, and even some of the magnetic guidance is is quite interesting as well in terms of moving the tip through through magnetic guidance, but different ways of manipulating the tip so that you get easier, more more accurate, and more repeatable access. Um, I mean, that's where I think the robot can really 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 help in this. I've seen some of those technologies using the magnet um, to control that sort of distal end and uh, MIT's got an, a clever robot and, and you were chatting about one when we were, we were speaking earlier in the week. Um, you know, but, but I also think about where does this robot exist and what kind of footprint do I already have in that room, if I'm, especially if I'm looking at the migration of some of these procedures going to an ASC. So in most of them, I've got to have big iron on the imaging side, Yeah. right? I've got to have other large carts or fixed systems in there. Um, and then I've got a team in there. And now I'm curious if I, if I add another form factor in there that doesn't take all that into consideration. And when I think about a magnetic driven platform, I do need a substantial amount of mass and form yes. factor in order to drive that catheter or guide wire to where I want to get it. Yeah. I, and I think that is, so it, it's not dissimilar to the soft tissue robotics. A lot of the challenges you have in places like ASCs, the same challenges are completely mirrored. Uh, de depends whether you're using endovascular or, or you're doing soft tissue. And, uh, you know, amount of hardware, size of hardware, and personnel is another one that is, is very interesting. It's, you know, can you now use some of these technologies to reduce the number of personnel required for some of these interventions? Because I think that's an important factor in when you're trying to take it to a lower acuity site of care. And, and you bring up a really good point because as we go to these ASCs, it's going to be interesting to see how they staff those because the economics in an ASC are tremendously different. What is interesting though, is the reimbursement in the endovascular space sits at a higher level than a general <laughs> surgery procedure. So the, the, the math changes and empowers in a totally different way. If you're looking at 5 million procedures each year, right? To give, to give a reference point, uh, last year, I think Intuitive did 1.8 million procedures. Yes. So, so, you know, and what do they own? 75% of that general surgery soft tissue market. Um, so you've got 5 million procedures and you've got a fifteen to $18,000 reimbursement strategy. And yes. you probably have a less complex robot from a cost perspective, servicing and maintenance perspective. And you can very clearly probably remove at least one head count from the room. Yeah. Uh, so, so it starts stacking up. And again, um, when I'm looking always at... Uh, areas in medical device i'm looking for the drivers you know what's what's the big driver what's what's the thing that's going to pull it because if, you, if you've got to push the boulder up the hill you know you, it's really hard to get some of these 
technologies to switch across if it's if it's just everything is an uphill push. But if you've got some real pull coming from the market because you've got you know favorable reimbursement for it, you've got the desire to take it to a different place of care. If you can reduce staff, that's that is a I, I think it's not just about reducing staff. The staff availability in some parts of the world is just like so difficult to deal with at the minute. So if you've got all those things that just help the institution, help the hospital, and are in their favour, then I think you, you'll see a much faster adoption of that technology and a pull through of that technology. So I think that's why it is a really exciting space. Also, one of the things that I look at when I think about it in the vascular space, and we can go to form factor in a minute because there's platforms out there like Microbot, and I want to talk about yes. Microbot versus a large platform like perhaps a Corindus as a, as a, as a placeholder or Robocath. <clears throat> but when, when, I, when I think about that endovascular, especially on the neuro side of things, is that setup time is going to be really imperative um, in regards to certain procedures where time is of essence. And, anything, yeah. and we were looking at, I was looking at one yesterday and, and, and the, 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 the interventionalist who was demonstrating it had showed that they do a dry run before they start the procedure to, just in case the robot goes down to swap out the cassette to then come in and then make sure we can do it manually. And that adds probably another seven to 10 minutes up to 15 minutes to the setup time. And so you've got to look where time is brain in those areas, what, what and how do you address that unnecessary or critical setup time? Yeah. And again, when I look at the systems that are currently on the market there today, um, I think they're a good first attempt. But I think some of those things that you say, which is this, you know, critical speed of setup time, every second counts. And uh, anything that can be done with the systems, and I'm I'm not familiar with too many of the new systems that are you know, like really under the radar at the minute, but I will be digging in. Um, I think that that they have to go. One of the things they've got to do is that is that speed of setup, speed of tear down, reduction of staff, yeah, cost as well. It will be important. It will be important. You can't just have unlimited money going at this. So I think I think there's a lot of things that, if I was in a startup space at the minute, I think I'd have a really good mapped out needs uh, chart that I'd go after. And, th and then looking, w the, the nice thing is, is we've had the chance to watch the market, at least from uh, an analog perspective, watch how intuitive sort of really stumbled their way through their early years to where the market is right now and, and, and clearly market dominant. And then we've watched the fast followers try to go after that in, in similar fashion. So there were lessons learned along the way that to your point, you just pointed out, it's not always about the performance of the robot as the primary driver. It's the mm -hmm. economics, the change management, which is super critical. Really and, then, critical yeah. and then how long does it take me to learn on this robot? That's going to be really important. Um, because on one side, it really does accelerate the competency curve uh, on, on early stage surgeons. Uh, or interventionalists, it really accelerates it. Uh, but how long is it going to take for me to learn how to use this system, this robot? And this leads me into the form factors. You can look at the Corindus type platform. Yeah. You can look at the Microbot platform, which is a fully disposable robot. Yeah. That I, 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 I'm guessing that that little joystick console may cost a thousand dollars, and you tossing it out. And from what I understand, is they're going to be able to use standard wires um, in order to drive that. So that that then becomes a really interesting economic um, sort of equation to to unplug. Yeah, I, I think it'd be interesting. And, and Harrell and the team, I've spoke to them in the past. And um, yeah, I find it interesting. The concept of a disposable robot, when I first heard it, I was like, seriously? But then when you actually look at it, it's, it's not as crazy as you first think. You, you think to yourself, um, as you were talking about, you know, if it can mean that you've got a much smaller form factor, if you don't have to deal with things like the same sort of cassettes and all that kind of stuff and the setup, and it can be faster and faster to intervention, you start thinking, hmm, actually, maybe it's not as crazy as I first thought. So, yeah, yeah, no, I agree. Yeah, again, and, and I'm going to be at LSI in March, and we're going to have a panel where we're going to talk about robotics, the right robot at the right time in the right 
scenario for the right patient. And I think about a microbot as one of those, not the final solution. That might not be, and it won't be, your endovascular robot, but it will be in the suite of products that you'll take into consideration based upon get me off that shelf, patient coming in, let's use a microbot system, let's roll. Right. That's yeah. that's where I think we're going to start to see more in the endovascular space than anybody else. I'm curious what you say about this. Do you think Gary and the team at Intuitive don't already have these going on uh, in their skunk works? So why was I very curious about the endovascular space when I was looking at this was because if you look at, you know, if you've got ion, right, that's a catheter-driven system. You've got Monarch, uh, which is a catheter-driven system. And um, it's not a huge leap of technology to be able to jump from what they're doing today in the long to what, you know, doing that as an endovascular robot. And, you know, the endovascular space is potentially up to an 8 billion space. You, you can't really ignore it. Now, whether they'll ever get into it or whether J&J or... Or, or intuitive will actually ever get into that space is different, but they've got to be looking at it, right? You've got to be, your engineers have got to say, we'd have to modify X, Y, and Z, but, you know, technically we've got the ability to do this. So I'll be, I'll be surprised if they've not got some kind of program within there that's already looking at how do you adapt the technology in-house to be able to do that. Well, I think you're onto something there because uh, in order for Monarch to get over the line, um, they needed to pick up the IP from Hansen. And yes. Hansen was used to drive that sort of catheter technology, which yes. originally was focused not in the pulmonary space. So um, I, I think that sits in there. Now, do I think that J&J &J has the internal team to drive that? I don't think so. And I don't think they should waste their calories or R&D dollars on that. This is where I believe you're going to have the smaller companies develop these technologies. And unless you're a digital native and you spend all your money and all your time, you, I, think it, I think Gary said a while back, I'm a, I'm a surgical company. I'm not a robotic company, but everything they do is going to be driven by robotics. So to your point, you can't, you can't, disregard $8 billion market where there are, again, no primary players right now who own the market. So it's interesting when you say about intuitive and we're a surgical company. So as most people point out, it used to be called intuitive surgical, and now it is called intuitive. And they very, they actually, I wouldn't say stealthily, but they, they removed the surgical. And, and again, for me, that sort of as a marketing strategist tells me that you're trying to not be just surgical. And of course, ION is not considered surgical, but it opens up a spectrum of other areas you can go into uh, where, where the robot can be at the center of it, your digital ecosystems can be at the center of it. And, and you can just leverage all of that infrastructure that you have to go into big open spaces and, you know, and, and do really good things there. So I think they would do that. There's an interesting thing, and I'd like to get your opinion on it as well, which is, so let's, you, you said about j, &J. So, so they've got, they've got their monarch technology. I, I think what would be sensible for some of these companies to do is to say to a small startup, here, have at it, take the core technology, we, we're all going to grant this into you, but you guys go and work out how you turn that into an endovascular robot. And I think that that, in my mind, could be a, a methodology to get that rapid innovation, um, which the small companies are good at, but with a really focused purpose, which is you go and build that and it comes back in when it's ready. Yeah, and that's that <clears throat> build to buy model that I think we're gonna see more of. As long as the, you know, Big Blue, Medtronic, and Big Red J&J &J can get over there, if not built here, you don't understand us, you don't know how to work that through the process. And it's not a knock, it's a fact. Um, you know, it's serially uh, evidenced every day. But I, I do believe you've got to put that, you've got to create an entire, and, and they're, they're, they're trying to do that. j and is trying to do that right out yes. in the Bay Area right yeah. now. Um, I think Martin's leading that, who's a wonderful man. Um, but you still have, when I chat with them, 
and 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 I have really intimate conversations with them, you can still feel that lockstep walk of this is how we do things. And if you continue with this is how we do things, you get the same things. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I definitely felt um, that there's there's a shift in that company. Uh, you know, I see that shift with with the recent uh, changes to change in medtech. I'm very hopeful, actually. I'm actually very hopeful that J&J is working this out. I mean, I've seen how they've done with the Abiumed deal. That is the right way to do it, yeah. the way they've done that deal. I'm actually very impressed by the way that they've done that. And they're seeing the rewards of it, right? Yeah, you know, they're already seeing the rewards of that. And again, with the Abiumed going in that space, you know, now they used to have Cordis and they used to have um, a Neuro um, company as well. And they sort of divested out of those. But may maybe now is the time... Uh, for them also to think about how do they get back into those markets in a meaningful way. And that'll take the leadership. Steve, what, I've been at this 32 years. Here's what happens is, and I agree with you, I like what J&J is doing a lot, a lot. I just want to make sure they remain disciplined, you know, from Braveheart. Hold, hold, hold. <laughs> um, because once that becomes or continues to evolve to the jewel in the crown, and let's use Abiumet as that, yeah. People want to manage their careers and their success through the entity rather than fixate on the entity. And culturally, Mike Minogue built that as patient product self. And he really lived that. You can go back and yeah. see a recent podcast Mike was in the studio on. And what I always worry about, I don't doubt that J&J as a corporation puts the patient first what I worry about are people who are 20 to 30 years into their career have been locked into J and J for a long time and now see the pretty new, pretty girl at the dance and now want to start justifiably. So getting on that and then influencing what happens in there, which means bringing in the SOPs and the mindset of the big corporation. So the executive leaders are going to really have to create, a wall around that in order for that innovation to continue to be accelerated and not dilute what got us there in the first place, right? It's yeah. it's a little like Florida. And we get nervous down here in Florida that all the New Yorkers are moving down here. And now they're trying to change it into New York because that's what they're used to. And we're like, no, no, no. If you're coming down to Florida, you're coming down here because how it is today. Don't try and change it to New York because you're from New York. <laughs> like live our Florida life. And that is a little bit like, you know, when you get these big organizations by these unbelievable companies, they by design can't help themselves. And what corporate leadership has to do is design it so that cannot be infiltrated. Yeah, no, I agree. And, and it, it does amaze me so much how, how sometimes it's misunderstood the power and the drive of culture within an organization. And if you strip out that culture, you rip the heart out of the company. I've seen it so many times, you know, with, with acquisitions over the years. So yeah, I, again, I think the smart, the smart companies in the future will, that they, they will understand they're not just buying metal and plastic. They're buying human beings and culture in the middle of that. They're the things that have made it really successful. So yeah, I'm look, look forward to see how that pans out over the years. Yeah, I want to I want to wrap back around to the endovascular space for a second. We've talked about therapeutic, um, the for most of the conversation earlier. There are a couple platforms out there right now that are diagnostic robotic platforms in nature, and especially in um, the interventional cardiology and structural heart space, where if you think about the unlock in that market, it's been imaging. And yes. so now you've got a, you know, you've got a, 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 a team typically in that, you know, cath lab suite of a dance that has to go on all the time. And the interventionalist has their relationship there. But I believe that under development right now are some very interesting self-driven by the interventionalist diagnostic robotic imaging technologies that will make it through the FDA in relative terms cleaner and easier 
And I think that you're going to start to see an entire category of diagnostic, robotic, sort of driven systems that have the same baseline as an endovascular therapeutic um, delivery mechanism, only now we will have imaging enter in. And that, that's really critical because that ties into another category, Steve, that's growing very quickly is precision guided therapies. Uh, yes. you know, so there's a company out there called On Target, and they've got a product called Cytolux, and, and Stryker is partnering up with them. And what they're able to do is take a molecule and put it into uh, a cancer cell, and it lights up and allows the surgeon then to go in. So think about big iron, the GEs, the Philips, the Siemens, that you can go pre-op imaging, and then you think about the therapeutic side downrange, and all of those, whether it's Stryker, Boston Psy, Olympus, whatever it is, uh, and now in the middle, you can light up what you're trying to get into and, 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 and use as a therapy, and then drive endovascular robotics towards that, um, you're gonna have a very interesting solution coming up soon. Yeah, I think that um, across the whole spectrum of healthcare, precision targeting, so it's, it's the targeting systems in the, in the perioperative phase, that are going to become really interesting. And again, I, I going to go back to intuitive. I think that ION, they're going to use that as a guidance map for when you come alongside to go and make sure that instead of taking a whole wedge out now, you can have super precision and take a bleb out. You know, you're able to light up just that small area. And the same will be true in endovascular, that you'll be able to have a um, precision guided diagnostic that will then allow a either delivery or targeting or it would but it will allow you to be much more precise in your deliver of therapy and therefore of less collateral damage and less mm -hmm. collateral effects yeah that, that that is definitely coming um and and i think again it's always when there's a confluence of technology that allows it so the robotic technology is improving it's miniaturizing it's getting smaller the targeting technologies are improving daily um and then the 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 smarts behind it, the AI and the compute power that you need to make these things really effective are coming. So you start getting this convergence of all these technologies that allow this to become more and more precise. So yeah, I think there's a whole category there for sure. Yep. And then final question as we wrap up, I want to ask you, because you usually have some insights into these things more than the average bear. Um, the Gen 5 intuitive release uh, coming out, which I think, uh, I think we talked about this, uh, they were clever because it's just going to freeze the market until the end of the year on anybody buying anything. Uh, do you think that they're going to introduce as an option um, an open console? So I, I've speculated a little bit on this. Um, you have to remember back in the day, they actually did have an open console back when they took Zeus. So, so it's not, they're not strangers to it. They made a strategic decision at the time and they felt that the, the eye to hand coordination that you got with the periscope view was, was the paradigm that they preferred. I think it, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be one of two things. They're either going to really entrench and dig their heels in and say, no, 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 the periscope is the only way. Or, um, they're going to listen to the market where I can say more than half the market prefers an open console. I just, we just hear it all, all day, every day that um, people prefer that. And what, what they're trying to do at the minute is that I, a big piece of getting across to their full line of sight procedures that they're after, you have to bring those laggard laparoscopists on board. You have to. So, is one of the tools that you could do to that is for those that say, I will not stick my head into a pair. I am not sticking my head. I've done 25 years with an open screen. I want an open screen. I'm having an open screen. Do they fight that or do they say, okay, if we want to hit that 25% of surgeons that will never bring across without it, unless they have an open screen, then there is a chance that there could be an option that if you want an open screen, we will allow you to somehow use an open screen with our system. I don't know. But I think if they've gone out there and done any market research in the past years, which I'm sure they do every single day, there's a, there is a slice of the market that has to have an open screen to come across. Yeah. I'm really curious and if it comes out now in the Gen 5, which may add a level of complexity they may not want to deal with with the FDA, 
Um, but I was just curious what your thoughts are. So I've been getting pinged on that, and I'm 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 along the lines with you. I think they will have it as an option. I just don't know if it's going to be this year. So yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, my friend. Uh, as always, I enjoy the conversation, and um, I will be looking forward to our next one. Excellent. Thank you very much, and uh, have a great day. Take, Take care. care. Take care. I'm Joe Mullings. Untitled, provocative and necessary conversations. Be well.